All right, good morning, Carson Bible Church. I would ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Zechariah chapter 10. This morning we are finishing chapter 10 of Zechariah. We're working through verses 6 through 12. So as you're turning there, I will pray, and then I will read through the passage, and we will get started. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word, which is truth. We thank you for your sovereignty, Father. We thank you for your son, Jesus, our savior, his redeeming work on the cross in the empty grave. We thank you for his intercession for us at your right hand. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, for conviction of sin, for leading and guiding your people, for his ministry of sanctification and his promise of eternal life with you by being adopted as your children. God, we love you, we praise you, we ask your blessing on our time in your word this morning. In your name, amen. All right, well, we are continuing in the series of One Point Sermons. And uh, if you remember that the context of all these One Point Sermons is the coming of this Davidic Messianic King. And all of these uh, promises of God in Him. Sure enough, today is a one point sermon. The main point for today is that the Lord will restore His people. So let's look through this passage and we'll just work through it together. Zechariah chapter 10, starting in verse 6. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back, because I have compassion on them, and they shall be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. Then Ephraim shall be, become like a mighty warrior, and their hearts shall be glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and be glad, their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them in, for I have redeemed them, and they shall be as many as they were before. Though I scatter them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me, and with their children they shall live and return. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria, and I will bring them to the land of Gilead and to Lebanon, till there is no room for them. He shall pass through the sea of troubles and strike down the waves of the sea, and all the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. I will make them strong in the Lord, and they shall walk in his name, declares the Lord. Well, one thing I want to point out before we get started into these verses is something that's interesting in this entire overall passage is that God himself is the subject of every active verb here. So I will strengthen, I will save, I will bring them back, I will answer them, I will whistle for them, I will gather them in, I have redeemed them, I scattered them, I will bring them home, I will gather them, I will bring them home. And so the overall motivator here is God's sovereign hand. If the message is that the Lord will restore his people, the means is by God himself. It's not something that God's people are going to work up themselves. It's not something they're going to earn. It's not something they're going to make happen on their own. It will happen by God's own hand. It's the Lord himself who will restore his people. God is the primary mover and actor here. As I had mentioned before, 
Some of these passages in Zechariah actually are some of the most difficult passages to interpret and apply. And if I could just give a little bit of a quick disclaimer, some of my commentaries on some of these passages just have essentially blank spaces where they have no commentary on entire passages. Um, but I believe that uh, actually that's a good thing. It drives myself especially and it should drive you as well to really depend on the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to give us insight and clarity here. So let's work through these verses together. Verse 6 is really kind of the thesis statement, if you will, of this entire message. It tells what God plans to do, and then the following verses will support it and explain in some further detail. Verse 6 says, I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. To speak of Judah and Joseph is to speak of the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Of course, Joseph uh, was the father of Ephraim and Manasseh, and they were two uh, prominent tribes in the northern kingdom. And we'll see that Ephraim gets mentioned again later. And actually, uh, there are other occasions in the Old Testament where Ephraim sort of becomes a, a stand-in for the entire northern kingdom of Israel. And so what this speaks to, to mention the two together here, is to speak of a reunited kingdom. Right? The, the kingdom of Israel starts to come together as a nation under Saul, um, is really established under David and then Solomon. And then after Solomon, it falls apart into two separate kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And to speak here of strengthening and saving both of them is to speak of a reunited Israel. And actually... Um, there are times in Israel's history where uh, some of the kings actually tried to make that happen. Um, it, it's sort of implied that Jehoshaphat, he was a, was, was a great king, um, but he seemed to be a, trying to get a little too close and too friendly with uh, the wicked northern king, and uh, that's to his detriment. Kingdom will only be reunited by God's doing. And it's really interesting here, actually, how they're named Judah and Joseph. Remember in the story of Joseph, back in Genesis, when his brothers decide to rid themselves of their dreaming younger brother, it was Judah who had the idea of selling him to the slave traders. It was Judah who determined to at least make a profit from their younger brother if they were going to be rid of him. And of course, there are many years, many instances of animosity between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And yet here, the promise is that under God's restorative hand, the kingdoms will be reunited again as one. And in fact, this opening promise, I will strengthen, actually you'll see that repeated in the very last verse here. That idea that God himself will strengthen his people is sort of what bookends this entire message. I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. God will restore his people because he is compassionate or merciful in nature. It's not because his people earn 
his favor. It's not because his people have merited God making good on his promises. God makes good on his promises because he is a compassionate and merciful God. It's God's compassion that is a driving characteristic to motivate his action here in this passage. Psalm 111, if you follow along with our um, prayer meeting devotionals during the week, we worked through Psalm 111 um, just this past Wednesday. And we looked at how mercy or compassion is an attribute of God. It's a defining characteristic of who God is. But also in other passages in the Bible, for example, in Exodus 33, we're told that God will have compassion on whom he chooses to have compassion. So in some sense, God is by definition a compassionate and merciful God. But at the same time, God chooses those upon whom he will be compassionate. It says, they shall be as though I had not rejected them. What a powerful promise. It emphasizes the, the degree of completeness to which God will restore his people, Israel. They shall be as if I had not rejected them. Amazing. Because you can imagine that rejection by God would leave some scars. Would probably leave you walking with a limp. Might leave some bruises behind. And yet, the restoration of God is so great that the ones restored actually appear as if they had never been rejected by God in the first place. As we go on, verse 7, Then Ephraim shall become like a mighty warrior, and their hearts shall be glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. The restoration under God's hand will bring a reaction and a response of joy and gladness, singing and worship, right? The idea of um, their hearts shall be glad as with wine. That's, remember, that's just a simile, okay? But the idea of God's salvation, God's restoration, bringing a response of joy and gladness shows us that uh, what Zechariah is foreseeing puts him in agreement with the Old Testament prophets that came before him who also had visions of Israel's restoration. Uh, one example is Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9. Isaiah writes, it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The restoration of the Lord brings great joy. Verse 8, I will whistle for them and gather them in, for I have redeemed them, and they shall be as many as they were before Again, this idea of whistling for them, or some of your translations might say, I will call for them. But this is bringing in kind of the idea of God as the shepherd of his people. And we've seen uh, that metaphor uh, used by Zechariah in the previous passages. shepherd calls his flock and they draw near to him. He says, I will whistle for them and gather them in for I have redeemed them. Again, this kind of brings us back to what we were talking about in Psalm 111 in our prayer meeting time. Is that redeeming 
to redeem something or someone means to buy them back at a price. God is in the business of buying his people back. And here, he's in the business of gathering them out of Gentile nations. Again, speaking to his restoration, they shall be as many as they were before. Years of prolonged conflict with foreign nations like Assyria. And having their cities destroyed and having captives carried off would have been devastating to the population of Israel. And here the the focus of restoration is that their population will be restored. Here the Lord will redeem his people out of exile in the same way as he redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. He goes on to say in verse 9, Though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me, and with their children they shall live and return. So as the Lord has remembered his people, so scattered among the nations, they will remember him and will return to him. Just as, as an aside here, do you remember what Zechariah's name means? If you have trouble remembering, just remember that Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. And that was the point of some of Zechariah's night visions that we saw in the beginning of the book, right? Was that the Lord had not forgotten the plight of his people Israel. The Lord remembered. And the Lord remembered the nations that had mistreated them and oppressed them. And so as much as the Lord remembers his people, so Scattered among the nations, they will remember him, and they will return to him. Verse 10, I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to the land of Gilead and to Lebanon. Now certainly, captives were taken by Assyria, and certainly, probably... Uh, people had left the land of Israel and fled to Egypt, but it seems that there were some captives that were even taken to Egypt as well. But it may be here that Assyria and Egypt are sort of just representatives of all of the nations that had oppressed Israel and at different times had carried off captives and slaves. And God says, I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria, and I will bring them to the land of Gilead and to Lebanon. Gilead and, Gilead and Lebanon were regions that were considered to be part of the land that was promised to Israel. Uh, Gilead being across the Jordan and north, Lebanon being a little bit further north, but they were kind of the, the farther reaches of Israel. So for God to say that he's gathering his people from Gentile nations and he's going to bring them in so that they occupy these sort of far reaches of the land promised to Abraham would mean a very complete Restoration, a very uh, complete occupation of the promised land. Verse 11, He shall pass through the sea of troubles and strike down the waves of the sea and all the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. This is just to say that as easy as it was, for God 
to bring his people out of slavery in Egypt by opening up the Red Sea, and allowing his people to cross on dry land, uh, so also there will be no obstacle to the restoration of God's people in the land that he had promised to them. As God remembers his covenant people and they remember their covenant God. There is no obstacle in the way, whether geographical or whether governmental, political, authoritative. The Gentile nations here will lose their pride and their scepter, speaking to their authority, and their own sovereignty. The nations will not be able to interfere or stop God's program of restoration of his people. And here's, here's where we're going with this. We believe these prophecies to be eschatological. Certainly, we want to think about uh, trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the people of Zechariah's generation and to think about what it would have meant for them, right? And certainly, we've talked about how Zechariah and his generation were people who had left Babylonian exile. They, they had left Persia to return to their homeland. They were tasked with rebuilding the temple. They were tasked with securing their city, Jerusalem. But here as God through Zechariah is speaking of gathering his people from Gentile nations and restoring them, we have to believe that this is something that doesn't happen in Zechariah's generation. Because largely, Zechariah and his generation were on the tail end of the exiles returning from Persia. So, yes, there have been some calls for those who seemingly by choice have remained in Persia and are still living there. There have been some calls from Zechariah for them to come back to their land. Um, this sort of divine, sovereign gathering of people in this strengthened nation restored to its greatest borders, united, speaks to something that doesn't happen in Zechariah's time. The language here just speaks of a completely different scale of gathering and restoration that even for us today, we've not yet observed this scale of restoration historically. Certainly, just as in Zechariah's time, there was a gathering of exiles. We have seen other gathering of ethnic Jews from around the world back to their homeland but this, not to this scale, we haven't seen it happen yet. And so as much as this promise was still future to Zechariah, it's actually still future to us too. Also, it's important to note, we don't believe that these promises have just been fulfilled spiritually. We believe that these are literal promises that will be fulfilled literally. And one of the reasons is we see these very specific geographic regions. Gilead is a real place. Lebanon is a real place. And we expect these things to be fulfilled literally one day. But it's been a long time since Zechariah prophesied these things to his people. It's been a long and arduous path 
for the people of God. And sometimes the path to fulfillment of God's promises is that way. Some friends and I have enjoyed hiking in Yosemite National Park. And one of the things that we've liked to do is hike to the summit of Half Dome. Um, Half Dome being a very prominent landmark in Yosemite. And it's really interesting when there's a number of routes to get to the summit, but the route that we've taken, when you stand at Glacier Point and you are essentially looking across Yosemite Valley at your destination, Half Dome, it seems pretty straightforward. And you see, you see your objective and it is glorious and it's majestic and it's beautiful and you're excited you have to start hiking at sunrise, but you start the day very excited and very confident that you're going to reach that objective. But then what happens as you start on the trail is that you see your objective there and you start hiking a completely different direction. And not only that, is you start hiking downhill. And when you're trying to reach a summit, you want to hike uphill, not downhill. And then at some point on the trail, you actually lose sight of the objective. You can't see the summit anymore. And you hike for hours and hours and hours. And it's lunchtime and you sit down and eat your lunch and then you keep hiking and you keep going and you keep going and you start to, to wonder if, if you're ever gonna make it if you're ever gonna get there. And really, your only choice is to trust the map. You have to trust the, the trail that's laid out before you. You have to trust that a number of others have hiked that same route before and they have achieved making it to the summit and making it back home. Because once you do start hiking uphill and you get some encouragement that you're actually on the right path, then it gets really, really steep. And then the trail actually starts to become vague in some points and you're not entirely sure if you're on the right path. And then you start to see the summit again and you're encouraged, but at the same time, to get to the summit of Half Dome, the trail ends, and there are a pair of steel cables that you have to hang on to and get about another 300 or so feet. It might be more than that. You have to get quite far up what appears to be a vertical granite face before you make it to the summit. And then once you make it to the summit, you, you're excited, you feel like you've made it, then you have to go down, and you're tired and you're exhausted. And when you go down, it's downhill all the way, and you have to go down by waterfalls on a rocky path which make it slippery. There's just a number of times where all you can do is trust the map. You have to trust the trail because sometimes the path is just arduous and it seems like it's not going the right direction. It seems much longer than you expected it to be. And that is what has been true for God's people throughout history. Think of how long it took them to get from Egypt to the land of Canaan. 
as we close here with this final verse, verse 12, we hear the echo of that opening promise, I will make them strong in the Lord. And then this line, and they shall walk in his name, declares the Lord. It reminds us that it's only in God's strength that we can accurately image him in this fallen world. What does it mean that God's people shall walk in his name in the strength of the Lord? It means that strengthened by God, his people will be his representatives on earth. They will be his name bearers. And it's only in the strength that God provides that we can do that appropriately. See, these promises certainly are made to Israel. But aren't we as Gentile believers as the church, aren't we also still awaiting the fulfillment of some promises? As much as Israel was awaiting the messianic shepherd king, we as the church are awaiting the return of the very same. So in this twisting sometimes arduous, sometimes vague path of human history. What does it look like for us as God's people, as Gentile believers in the church, to live as his image bearers? What does it mean for us to walk in his name? As we look at some of the things that God has said in this passage. How many of us have actually lost our compassion? Especially mid-pandemic. Look, remember, we just got through chapters 7 and 8 where God, through Zechariah, was exhorting his people on how they had failed to be compassionate to those most vulnerable in their society. And not just through Zechariah, but they had failed the same exhortation from previous prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. They had failed to care for the poor, for the immigrants, for the widows, for the orphans. And I think it's worth asking ourselves, mid-pandemic, how many of us have lost our compassion for the most vulnerable in our society? How many of us are losing compassion for those who are still at home, crippled by fear and anxiety and depression because they're not yet ready to leave the perceived safety of their homes? How many of us have lost compassion for those who have lost loved ones due to the pandemic? Those are real lives that have been lost. Those are real people. Their sorrow and their mourning and their grieving is real. And yet, some of us six-day creationists are sounding awfully Darwinian in our response. What does it look like for us to remember the Lord? What does it look like for us to remember that 
we've been saved by his grace alone, by his mercy alone, from the grip of sin and death. And it is by God's sovereign, kind hand that we've been transferred out of darkness and into light. What does it look like for us to remember him? What does it look like for us to find our greatest joy in the coming kingdom of Christ rather than in the pleasures and comforts and conveniences of this world. Ruth Chow Simmons says, when one chapter closes and another is still not ours, the beauty we get to experience is seeing how the Father provides in the now and not yet. Though in some ways God's program of restoring his people was already underway in redeeming them out of Babylonian exile. And so also the establishment of God's kingdom is already underway in that Christ, the king of that kingdom, has come and has worked redemption on the cross and has defeated death in the empty grave, we also are still awaiting a completion, a complete fulfillment of those promises. In the meantime, let's be people who live in his strength and who walk in his name. Let's be people who exhibit his compassion and mercy. Let's be people who point others to the greater joy that's coming in his kingdom rather than the fleeting joys of this world. Why don't you pray with me? Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would keep our eyes fixed on Christ, who was the perfect image of a true, holy God. Help us to remember that your sovereign, divine programs will not be hindered or thwarted by any human kingdoms. Help us to remember that as much as we live for your coming kingdom, we also are to display kingdom citizenship, kingdom characteristics in the now and the not yet. That in this, what seems like a long and arduous path to seeing your promises fulfilled, that we would live as kingdom people and that we would call others to join us on this path of being disciples of Christ and invite them into adoption into your holy family in his name alone. Amen.